the broadcast um, and webcast web webinar of the securely sharing documents in the bioscience industry. I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, to participate in this webinar. My name is Steve Joseph. I'm the Vice President of Market Development at ShareVault. And I'll be going through um, a variety of different topics today. Uh, before we start, just to let you know, we will um, go for an hour, um, but certainly end at the top of the hour. We started just a couple of minutes late. Um, you can submit questions via the question box, but it's a small enough group that if you also want to speak up, you can unmute the microphone in your control panel, and if you're not in too noisy environment, feel free to submit questions um, or interact um, with your microphone if you have one. Um, we are uh, recording the webcast, and we'll be passing it along to uh, Rachel Lawrence at the uh, BIA. Um, so that uh, if Rachel wants to share it with members that couldn't attend, she's welcome to do that. And we welcome your feedback after uh, the event as well. So I really appreciate your participation. Um, I'm going to cover a few different topics. Uh, the first is just talking about a variety of different um, security breaches. I'll walk through several different kinds. I'm going to talk to you about how documents are most commonly still shared today, what those tools are and what the limitations of those tools are in a variety of different dimensions. I'm also going to talk about uh, the applications where security is important, where you're sharing sensitive documents, and where security, um, what we hear, is regularly a concern, an issue, a need uh, that needs to be addressed. And then I'll give you a little background on Shevolf and our involvement um, in this area. And leave room for questions at the end as well. Hopefully there'll be some. Um, but I also encourage you to, uh, to submit those questions in the question box or, again, unmute your microphone if you want to speak up. Okay, I'm going to start with a couple of U.S. examples. I will get into some U.K. examples as well. But this was uh, an email, excuse me, this was an article in the New York Times last December, so only a year ago. Um, they got a lot of national and international attention because it was about hackers actually going after people in the biopharmaceutical industry. And what they were going after were the emails of biopharmaceutical CEOs looking for clinical trial information, regulatory information, safety and legal issues, anything that could be used to um, gain an advantage in stock trading. And these were not hackers from Eastern Europe or from China. These were actually North American hackers. And this got attention because, you know, up until then, a lot of people seemed to think that what, uh, what hackers were going after were credit card numbers and personal identifying information. And it's obvious that they're going after a lot more than that. Basically, every company is being targeted every day. Uh, there's a way to think of them. We've heard that uh, suggested several times by various government authorities that you need to be um, aware of that. Another example was an article um, about um, some insider theft. And this is the, not all of these breaches are, are actually outsiders um, and hackers, but this was insider theft where um, both an employee or ex-employee and a consultant who were working for DuPont um, entitled to have access to information, but not entitled to share that information with outside there, outside of DuPont, um, and they sold that information to a Chinese company, and obviously that was a very significant breach. So the breaches can occur with um, consultants, with hackers, a variety of other mechanisms. Um, a few other articles, this was um, an article about how one of the common file sharing services, and this is not the only one, the others have had some issues, um, even uh, as recently as this year, um, with some um, unexpected access by um, strangers to documents. Um, this was another example of somebody who um, was inside an organization and repurposed that information and sold it um, externally. Um, and then there's also breaches in regulatory compliance areas. This is in the U.S., which is our, um, our regulation for uh, personal health information. There's a similar one in the U.K. that I'll, I'll get to shortly. Some UK breaches, just to show you um, some examples that, uh, that are more relevant to you. 
Um, this was based on a survey that was done for the British government, um, conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and that uh, survey is available. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me and I'll have my contact info at the end. If you want a copy of the survey, I believe Rachel at uh, BIA also has a copy. Uh, well, I certainly can provide one for her. Um, this was in the survey. This was a 2015 survey um, and a stunning number of breaches. Now, these are all kinds. Again, it's not just hackers that are breaching, but these are where there was information that was lost um, in some way. And again, it's not just external, this was staff related breaches. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of it is not malicious, a lot of it is accidental. And here's the example of an accidental one. I think we've all probably run into this, especially when you have autocomplete in an email, where you actually start typing the address, it completes it for you, and after you send it, you realize that uh, you sent it to the wrong David or the wrong Mary. And uh, and that information went to somebody that shouldn't have received the information. And obviously, there are certain situations where that uh, disclosure can be very, very significant. Another example um, that also came out of the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey was about a company that had a essentially a, a virus um, that was infected through a peer-to-peer sharing website, one of the file sync and share services. And these are known as man in the cloud attacks. And you can certainly um, Google that and uh, go to the Imperva um, security company and they have a report that's available on that. When those uh, peer-to-peer file sharing services where um, the weakest link is obviously that laptop or that computer it's not on the server necessarily, it's on the laptop of the computer that has the, latest, the greatest vulnerability, the latest, least protection against um, some information being accessed. So um, just some things to think about there. I'll pause if you have any questions or have any comments, um, please um, speak up or contribute. Uh, you can unmute, for those of you who just joined, you can unmute your microphone if you do want to uh, make a comment. Here's another survey, it uh, was uh, again done by PricewaterhouseCoopers, but it's a different um, survey, um, also from 2015. It just shows the um, breaches that occur inside, and it can happen from customers. If you send a price quote to a customer that has confidential on it, and the customer takes it to a competitor and shares that information with a competitor, um, it can happen through suppliers and business partners, obviously, um, and so manufacturers and vendors are also just um, things to be concerned about where you are sharing um, sensitive information, certainly intellectual property, you're sharing that with any parties you want to be concerned about that. And then, as I illustrated in some of the examples, it can be consultants, it can be employees. I think you know lots of organizations have had disgruntled employees, they're always a vulnerability. Um, and so you want to be careful about how you're sharing the most sensitive information in your organization um, with others, both internally and externally, but especially externally. Typically, obviously, your employees are trusted parties, but uh, our situations where you may want to share, I mean, for example, board, board documents that are sent to board members um, are not typically shared with employees, equally sensitive information, but employees sometimes can get access to that information, especially if it's on an IP server, in, on an internal server. Okay, so the risks are lack of security, that somebody can breach the firewall, somebody can breach one of those peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services through the weakest link and, and get access to your documents. But there's another dimension to it, and that is the lack of control. Once somebody gets your documents, including people that you intended to be the recipients, so people you've sent documents to, you don't have control of what they do with those documents. And you don't have visibility into activity with those documents. Often if you provide documents to others, um, you don't even know if they've actually opened those documents. So let me review some of the common file sharing tools. I think everybody is most commonly still sharing documents via email. Um, it's easy to attach a document to an email. Um, the biggest limitation is sometimes the documents are too large and you can't send them via email. But other than that, we all still send documents via email. The thing for you to think about is 
whether you're using email for your confidential documents. I mentioned these um, peer to peer and these file sharing services, file sharing sync is also how they're commonly known. Um, these are a couple of examples. Um, great collaborative work environments, um, but once you've given somebody a document through this kind of service, just like with email, you've lost control over those documents and you have relatively little visibility into uh, any activity associated with those documents. And that continues, you know, there's cloud based services that are very popular like Google Drive and OneDrive for Microsoft. Um, some organizations, usually mid to larger size organizations, have Microsoft SharePoint. Um, file transfer protocol and technology actually from the 80s is still very commonly used to share very large files between two parties. There's even a secure file transfer protocol that, that protects from outside breaches. Um, but there are issues if you're sending documents via FTP and it is cumbersome if you have a a lot of documents to send, but uh, um, still a very popular technology. But once that recipient receives the document, again, you have no control over it and no ability to monitor activity. And then there's, um, you know, sending DVD, sending USB flash drives around, um, also commonly used, but you may not have control over your documents once the recipient receives those. Again, I'll pause. Any questions or comments? Please speak up. So the thing for you to think about is what are you using to share your documents? Now, I've talked about um, some of the um, document sharing tools. Let me talk about some of the applications where um, you want to worry about sensitive documents. Probably the most common and everybody realizes this is when you're going through a due diligence process. And when you're going through due diligence, what you want to do is make sure that those parties that um, receive the information, and typically, you know, there financials and intellectual property, and maybe there's employment agreements or contracts of various kinds, vendor lists, customer lists, um, just a variety of different sensitive information that you are sharing with, uh, with uh, multiple parties. Um, and you don't want them to have that information unless there's a deal in place. Um, so this is where you want to control and monitor document activity, and I'll come back to the monitoring because it, there's a second purpose of value from being able to monitor document uh, document activity, not just that uh, somebody opened it. But um, you also want to make sure, especially if you're doing dealing with a competitor, if a competitor is potentially buying you, um, you obviously have to share your information with that competitor, but you don't want them to have that information if there's no deal that goes through because obviously then um, they have an advantage uh, that they didn't have beforehand. Um, so that's specific to the due diligence process and also very much in the biopharma uh, space as uh, I imagine most of the attendees today do come from a biopharma um, activity, a company or organization, but it's not just uh, true to biopharma, it's true in in a variety of different areas where you're going through due diligence of any kind, but you want to be very careful about protecting your information. But that's not the only kind of applications where you want to be concerned. I touched on this earlier. If you're sharing documents with distributors or vendors or manufacturers or CROs or regulatory advisors, outside consultants of any kind, and, and many, many companies are um, virtual companies, they outsource as much as they can because of the cost of developing um, product and so they outsource their um, services to lots of different parties. Those are trusted parties um, that you may not be doing business with them next year or the year after. And do you want them to still have your information at that point? These are again a couple of applications to think about. It's just good corporate governance to be uh, protecting your information when you're communicating with board members. This ties back to the CEO emails. Um, certainly, if CEOs are sending information to their board members via email and there's attachments that uh, that are financial information um, or other important information about the company, that's where you want to think about, you know, how am I sharing my documents. Truth for law firms, truth for accountants and auditors, and I'm sure you can think of others that you might be dealing with where you're sharing confidential documents outside the firewall of your organization. But this doesn't just apply to biopharma companies. It doesn't just apply to medical device companies or diagnostics companies. If you're um, in a CRO or a CMO, 
you have your protocols that you are sharing with clients or prospective clients, and that's very sensitive information. I know of some CROs that actually require their clients to come on site. They don't want to share that sensitive information through any other mechanism than face-to-face. Um, there are law firms that uh, are sharing documents during litigation um, or sharing documents with clients. There's universities and research organizations that are doing tech transfer. They are trying to find a license for their um, technology that's been developed. And um, sometimes that information is before any patents have been filed. Another place to be you know, concerned about and thinking about how's that information being shared. Um, venture capital and private equity firms also have very sensitive information. When they're doing fundraising, obviously they're sharing their um, performance with uh, prospective investors. Um, when they are doing due diligence on, uh, on portfolio companies, um, VCs and private equity firms are sometimes sharing um, sensitive information that they've received from potential investment with outside consultants who are domain experts and maybe um, helping them. So there's a variety of different applications beyond just the due diligence and the transactional, transactional application for sharing information um, is, and how you're sharing information is important to think about. I touched on this earlier, compliance and regulatory arena. What you want in those applications where there is personal information being shared Bank rates, security, you want to be very clear about who gets access to the documents. You want to have a control over the documents, and you want to have a detailed audit trail of activity. Uh, and those are both for the reporting and the uh, compliance uh, requirements that are placed on you by these various agencies. Obviously, a couple of them are in the US, but there is the equivalent kind of uh, requirement in the UK as well. Um, this cartoon sort of illustrates how, uh, in, in a somewhat humorous way, but at the same time it's very serious, that if you provide your documents to somebody else, what they do with them, you have no visibility or control over. Questions? Okay, I'll keep going. So what is ShareVault? Um, ShareVault is a cloud-based platform that provides bank-grade security where control and monitoring of confidential documents is um, part of the system and can be used to um, manage documents that are being shared with outside parties. And what I mean by that, um, I'm about to illustrate. So I'm going to give you what I mean by control and monitoring. I'm trying to, I'm going to make very visible to you. Um, right now, let me switch to um, a different uh, to a browser, and I'm going to log into a Chevrolet system that's configured to show you what control and monitoring of control and monitoring of documents really means. Okay. So I'm going to log into a system. Let's imagine that this is a company, Celgenix, fictitious company, Celgenix, is sharing some documents with me. I've been asked to review those documents. I'm going to log into um, the system. And as I log in, there's a confidentiality notice that shows up to remind me that the information inside is confidential. What I'm going to see here is, well, I'll skip past the to this video tutorial, is a set of documents that are being shared with me by Celgenix. Um, it's in a project called Project Cell Risk. Here's some of the subfolders. I do know that there's, um, I've done my research on Celgenix. There is a clinical stage activity as well. Right now, all that uh, Celgenix is showing me is the preclinical information, so I don't have any more detail than preclinical. Um, it's a regulatory and some other information as well. Let's start just by showing you uh, one document in the corporate overview. So I'm learning a little bit about um, Celgenics here. When I go to open this document, um, you'll notice that I can print it and I can save it. So there's no hard controls on this document. I am going to um, go to um, full screen here. I need something inside so I can get there. So I'm going to go to full screen. I'll shrink it a little bit. Um, I said, again, you can print it, you can save it, there's no restrictions on what I can do with this document, but there is 
a watermark that's been applied. So there's some information that's been applied here to sort of make this an official document. It's not just that it comes from Cellogenics and that it's um, strictly confidential. It also has my email address, the date and time I'm located in the U.S., so the date and time that uh, I opened this document, and my Internet address. Um, all what this does is it essentially stamps the document as being an official document um, to some degree. Um, it says it comes from Celgenics. This person was authorized to um, review this document. But other than that, there's no limitations on the document. But let's go to and look at another document. Um, I'm going to now switch to the preclinical folder. There's a lot of subfolders on here, but there's a particular document. There's seven documents in this folder. Let me go look at this preclinical document. When I go look at this preclinical document, it also has the watermark. I'll go back to full screen and shrink that a little bit. It also has the watermark. In fact, uh, you'll see that not only is it on page one, but that watermark is on every page. As my email address, date and time I open the document, and the IP address again, and, and this continues on page three as well. But now, I can't print this document. There's no mechanism to save it, and there's no mechanism to cut and paste from it. I can't pull any text from this. What the watermark now um, becomes is a very strong deterrent to somebody doing a screen capture or taking a picture of the screen. Obviously, we have no mechanism for blocking pictures being taken in the screen. There actually are mechanisms to block screen capture, but uh, everybody has a camera on their phone these days, so it's easy enough to take the picture of the screen. The watermark becomes a very, very strong deterrent to do that because you've identified yourself as the person that took that picture. Um, and the liability and the exposure there is strong enough that most people are not going to do anything inappropriate with the document. I can uh, I can jump here to page five, um, and you know I'll see the watermark there as well. So. You get the point, hopefully, that this is one way that you now have control over documents in a very significant way. There's never a file that um, I, as Steve Anthony here, who's logged in, I um, I never have a file that I can do anything with. I, this is a view-only document. It's totally protected. I'm getting access to the information, but obviously they can take that information away from me at any time, and there's no record of it um, after that um, that I have in the form of a file. There is a search engine that I can find information on these get to be very big volumes of documents, along with the folder structure and navigating it through it. Um, I can also search for information um, through the search engine. I've showed you what control means. Now let me show you what monitoring means. I'm going to log out now and log back into the same Cellgenic system, but this time as an administrator. Again, I'll go back. I have a lot of demo shell vaults here. Um, when I go back into the system now, I'm also I'm reminded about the confidentiality of the information. And now notice, the previous system, there was 129 files um, in the system. I believe that's um, what was visible. Now there's actually 216. And when I expand the project cell list, um, I was right, there is a clinical program. So the folder structure that's inside the system is much more extensive than I want, got to see just as the user. Now maybe they were just unfolding some information to me and as the discussions, negotiations might evolve, they would show me more information. But this is another form of control over the documents where you get to unfold or stage the release of documents, um, but you have them all in one centralized place where they're secure and protected, um, available to those parties that are entitled to have access to them. And you can apply the controls that I just showed you as, as examples to these different um, folders and subfolders um, to protect the documents. On the reporting side, there's two types of reporting. One is kind of an activity summary. And Steve Anthony, who just uh, was looking at information that I know is in Large Pharma, so when I expand Large Pharma here, I'll see that Steve Anthony, when he last logged in, um, what, how many files he actually has access out of the total um, set that he had access to, actually it was 177. I mean, he's looked at 16 of the files. He's actually spent two hours um, on the system. And this is one more piece that you have of 
um, control and, and starts get, getting into the monitoring. And this, the value is just from a business intelligence perspective. You're going through, I'll tie it back to a due diligence process, but if you're going through a due diligence with somebody and you want to um, know if they're interested, rather than just telling you on the phone that they're interested in your information, now you have a very tangible mechanism to tell who is, um, are they really interested and who's the most interested. So now you can focus your time and efforts on those parties that are the most interested in what you're doing and that also um, give you um, some information about where they've been spending their time. You can expand this down to the folders to see where have they spent most of their time. This is very, very useful from a business intelligence perspective. The other value of reporting, and this is certainly true for the regulatory and compliance requirements, but also for just to know who has seen what, which is um, the kind of information that you don't have when you send a document via email or one of the mechanisms that I showed you earlier. I'm going to filter the activities here to just say viewing and downloading. I'm going to filter it to just see what Large Pharma was doing, and I'm going to leave it as today and update the report. And what you'll see now is that um, this person, Steve Anthony, uh, viewed this document, which is the first document we looked at. And not only do you know when they opened it, you know that they spent one minute looking at it. It's a one-page document, and they looked at that one page, and you also know their IP address. What you also know, like in the second document, and again, this becomes very valuable, is they spent two minutes on the second document. It's a 10-page document, and they looked at pages one, two, and three, and then jumped to page five. And this kind of information is, again, very valuable just from a business intelligence perspective. But it is a detailed audit trail where in legal situations, um, somebody says they haven't, didn't see the information. And I've heard about cases like this where um, information was being shared and, and after the investment was made, somebody said, the investor said, gee, I didn't see that information. This is a way that you can prove to them they actually did see the information. Um, and is very, very significant in a variety of different applications. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of what control over documents means and what monitoring of document activity means. Um, let me switch back to uh, the presentation here and I'll continue. Um, but I will pause again to see if any questions come in. Okay. So what you want to think about, and these are significant differentiators from the file sharing services, is um, do they have bank grade security? Um, some of them are getting better at that, and they all get started at kind of a consumer base, but, uh, but they're certainly paying attention to bank grade security. Um, nobody wants to have those breaches. You want to have the controlled access by groups and users, and then you want to have control over document, as I tried to I, um, illustrate. Um, being able to block printing, copying, and saving, and this is these are done individually, so you can uh, you combine them all, and um, uh, you're only viewing a document. You're not getting any more access to it than uh, being able to view it. I illustrated the dynamic watermark. What I didn't illustrate is the capabilities of some systems, and you certainly um, this can be useful. Is the ability to revoke access to documents that have actually been downloaded. Um, the nice thing about that is you can provide somebody with a document, if it's a clinical trial report, if it's a contract, if it's a large document, it's actually friendlier and easier to be, for that person to be able to view the document on their desktop and certainly scroll faster and, and uh, it's just more comfortable to be able to do that. But if you can keep control over that document, you know, even on somebody's desktop and have the ability to revoke access to it, you're in that much stronger position in terms of being able to control your documents. I illustrated the audit trail. Um, what you also want is, in any system you're looking at, for it to be very easy to use. Um, the nice thing about email, as I touched on at the beginning, is when you're sharing documents with other parties, it's so easy to just attach something to an email. If a system like I just showed you has a lot of complexity to it and is not easy to use, then people are just going to revert back to email. So whatever system is used to control documents and monitor document activity, you want to make sure that it's very easy to use and so it's not um, a chore to be able to get information through that kind of a mechanism. And you want to make sure that the system does support 
uh, regulatory requirements, regulatory compliance requirements um, in uh, in your particular geography or wherever you're selling your product. There are some things that are specific uh, needs for biopharma. Um, this is where email breaks down. Um, you've got uh, very large documents that you need to share with others. Um, and you have very large volumes of documents, certainly in a regulatory submission, and as you get to phase one, up through phase one to phase two, and then again from phase two to phase three, those documents um, grow both in the size of the documents as well as the volume of documents that you have. And you need a system that very efficiently can handle the sharing of very large documents. This is one of the places that file transfer protocol um, breaks down. Um, it's just not useful when you get to be on documents of any size. Also, email, of course, as well. The other thing to think about is in the biopharma space, um, when you're doing electronic submissions, there are often in fact, regularly hyperlinks between the documents in that um, submission. Um, in most cloud-based environments that I know of, those links break. It's no longer a folder environment. Uh, when you upload the documents that have these links between them into Google Drive or Dropbox or Box or any of the um, well-known SharePoint as well, I believe, although I'm not as sure of that. Um, when you upload documents into those environments, um, those links don't uh, don't work. Um, you want to have a system, and SharePoint is one of them that has them. Uh, that has a system where that you can preserve those links. It's that much more um, much friendlier for the user that's going to be looking at documents to um, jump from one document to another when those links work. And overall, this obviously enables more useful sharing of regulatory submission. So let me get into you a little bit about ShareVault. I've, um, you may not have heard of our name before. We have been around since 2007. We do have customers in uh, worldwide. Um, and both whether you look at it in dollars or in pounds, um, ShareVault has enabled tens of billions of dollars in transactions. Um, we do get used across a variety of industries and probably to some degree, except maybe the tech and clean tech, um, this reflects the membership of BIA. We're not just um, a lot focused on life sciences. We get used by VCs and private equity firms and other financial services organizations, certainly by law firms. Um, and get used in energy and natural resources, both generally and then biofuels and bioag specifically. Um, and our system has been designed to be used every, and does get used by everything from a one-person law firm to a very small virtual biotechs, um, even starting out. We've had um, university tech transfer offices such as ISIS Innovation at Oxford um, use ShareVault. We get used by large pharma, and I'll illustrate a few others um, in, a, in a moment. Um, we've been used by government agencies and large global financial institutions. And so it's not a service that's just made available for large companies or large organizations. In fact, the majority of our customers are probably organizations that um, kind of, again, map the demographics of DIA, um, small to mid-sized organizations. Here's a few examples of some of the um, customers that um, Cheval has and has had worldwide. Um, some of them are, you know, here's Bayer and Abbott, uh, well-known ones. Um, there are uh, ones in Sweden, in the UK, in Canada. Critical outcome is in uh, Canada. Um, Adaptomune, I don't know where they are on this chart. You'll see them again in a moment. Um, UK company um, in, in Korea, LG Life Sciences. And it's a mix. Um, this is a medical device company. Um, a lot of these are Biopharma. Here's another medical device company. BioReliance is a CRO. Um, we've got some healthcare systems. We've got some VCs. Domain Associates here is a VC. So just to give you a flavor of the mix of organizations, um, we've been adopted by first by Bio, but uh, fairly recently by DIA for their member benefits programs. Biotech Canada also adopted ShareVault for its member benefits program. And um, 32 other associations have adopted ShareVault as well for their member benefits program. So we've been um, vetted pretty closely. Here's a few of the UK organizations um, that uh, have been users of ShareVault. And some of them are customers, some of them are very familiar with us because they've been more on the user side. Um, a variety of organizations, you know, again, law firms and, and others. Um, you'll see on here, Devices Innovation. Um, here's Adaptimmune. 
Adapt Immune has been a share of our customer for many years, starting out um, using us initially for their original fundraising, not for their most recent very successful IPO. Um, they used us for that as well, actually. But, um, but they started using us for their early fundraising, as well as for some of the partnering that they did. So that's a couple of examples. Um, how do you get access to share vault? Um, it's um, a subscription model, which um, makes it very affordable, and that's why it works for both small and large companies, larger companies and organizations. Um, you can subscribe month to month. You can subscribe for six months or 12 months, sort of have it your way uh, model. And then it's based on the volume of the documents being stored. The subscription also does include training for administrators and users, although we never offer it for users, we never deliver it for users because um, the system is very intuitive, easy to use. I think I had a little flavor of that as I was um, showing you the control monitoring. And we do have 24-7 um, support, um, and that's phone and email support, and that is worldwide. So um, we do have an extensive uh, support organization as well. Um, what are the discounts that you get as a BIA member? Um, you get a 20% off uh, ShareVault's um, primary product. I won't go through all of these, but there are some significant benefits. You can find them on the BIA website and, uh, and learn more on the ShareVault website as well. But hopefully what I've done is given you, you know, some visibility into what control over documents means and what monitoring of documents means. And I, the reason, a lot of the reason I brought it in ShareVault is to illustrate that the state of the art is not just the file sharing um, services, that there are systems that exist like ShareVault beyond the simple file sharing services, which are great, again, in collaborative work environments, but are not very useful for um, protecting documents and monitoring document activity. And so you've got to decide when you're sharing your sensitive documents, what's most appropriate way to handle those documents that are being shared with outside parties? Um, even if they are sort of trusted parties, is that information that you want to keep control over? I'll pause there. We haven't had a, haven't gotten any questions yet, um, but I uh, would welcome any questions now, and you can either submit them in the question box, or you can uh, um, unmute, unmute your microphone. You should be able to do that, and uh, feel free to speak up. The quiet audience this afternoon, I assume uh, maybe people are getting ready to go home shortly. Well, I'd like to thank Rachel and uh, BIA for sponsoring this webcast um, and promoting it to the members. I hope this information was helpful. We are going to uh, end a little early. Um, there wasn't uh, much uh, interaction, but that's just fine. If you have questions, um, would like additional information, here's my contact info. If um, you would like a copy of the slide deck, I'm happy to provide that, or I can send it to, uh, to Rachel. Um, but feel free to reach out to me if you'd like a copy of the slide deck. If there's any um, information that uh, you dispute, that I shared today that you dispute or you know you have a different uh, view or perspective um, please you know let me know that I welcome your feedback as to whether this information is useful and uh, if there are no questions then um, we'll conclude the webcast in a moment um, one last uh, shot of asking questions but otherwise I very much appreciate your time and, and participation and, uh, and I hope this information I um, just gave you some food for thought. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time. And again, my, my thanks to BIA for promoting this webcast. Oh, there is a question. One last question I think just showed up. There's a very good question um, here. So, um, if it's paid for file sizes, how does that work if people are constantly changing the volume of files on the system? And that's a great question, uh, Ben. Thank you for that. Um, we can accommodate that in a variety of ways. One is um, we'll work out sort of what the average volume of documents is and, and um, come up with a pricing model that's appropriate for that. Um, we also um, 
can come up with a model where if you go over the volume that you think you're going to have, um, and let's say if there are times when it needs to be higher, maybe a few months it needs to be higher, we can accommodate that. Our mechanism does allow, our subscription mechanism does allow you to have certain months where, you know, if you say I'm going to go over, then you, the pricing is clear to you. But even in general, when organizations contract with us for a certain volume, and if they go over, it's not like penalties like cell phone minutes and other kinds of penalties. We just prorate the pricing so it's at the same rate as your, you know, as the volume that you've subscribed for. Um, or sometimes, depending on where you are in your subscription term, we can bump you up to the next level and handle it that way. So um, I hope uh, um, I hope that answers your question. Happy to give you more details, but that is not uncommon where the document volume um, does sort of fluctuate. Most of the time in organizations it's growing, but, but there are situations where the document volume does shrink and then grow again and shrink and grow again, and, and, uh, and we are set up to be able to accommodate that through a variety of mechanisms. Happy to speak with you personally on that. There's another question. The questions are coming in now, so I appreciate that people still staying on and asking the questions. Um, can you use the system, for example, um, for six months while I'm going through due diligence, then park it for two years, and then pick it back up again? And Donata, that's also a great question, and um, luckily I have an answer for it as well. We actually have two different mechanisms for that. So let's say you use it for actively for a transaction for six months, and then you don't need it for a while, and then you want to use it again, and you don't want to go through the hassle of shutting it down and archiving it and then setting it back up. One mechanism is what we call a deep freeze. It essentially just locks down the system. Um, it's at a very, very modest cost because there's not a lot of processing power when it's, nobody's using it. Um, it really is just storage, and so we make it a very modest cost for a deep freeze. And you can leave it in deep freeze as long as you want. I know one company we're working with right now, it's been in deep freeze for a year. Um, it's just locked down and um, available again, you know, the minute uh, that somebody wants to uh, start a, six, a new six month or whatever um, tra activity or transaction. But we also have something we call the Ever Ready mode, um, Chevrolet Ever Ready. Um, and that is where it gets locked down essentially from um, being used for external sharing, but it is accessible to you as the customer, as the administrator, and you can continue to use the system in an unlimited um, away. Again, the price is discounted from the normal price of, uh, of when you're sharing documents externally because that's when the system gets actively used and there's processing and, and a lot of activity that we're doing at that point and a lot of technology being used. But if you're using it internally, um, so the purpose of the EverReady program is to be able to have those documents maintained and current. So you always have the system ready for the next activity. Um, and sometimes, and in fact, often you don't know when that next activity is going to occur. The licensing partner may show up sooner, the investor may show up suddenly, or you may come across an investor. So if you want to have your documents uh, maintained to be current and just keep your documents in a centralized repository, good corporate governance anyway, um, have the documents in a centralized repository and then um, update them with documents, you have full access to the system. As long as you're not sharing documents externally, um, that fee is also a discounted fee. So hopefully that answered um, your question, Donata. Again, if you uh, if you want to send me an email or um, want to learn more, happy to discuss that with you. Any other questions? We've had a, a few here come in at the end, so um, we certainly still have some time available if I um, can address any of the questions. Again, the primary purpose of this um, session was really to illustrate that there are mechanisms for being able to control and monitor documents beyond what's most commonly shared. Some of you may be familiar with um, the term virtual data room or data room or deal room, there are different terms for it. Um, it's not, a lot of people don't know uh, what a virtual data room is, a deal room, but Sharewalt in that category. We refer to ourselves as a secure document sharing platform. But there are some systems, uh, again, not that well known, that are um, data rooms and, and share vaults in that category of products. Okay, we've got another question here, so let me uh, 
just uh, scroll down so I can see it. Another question, um, can you use it to share within the company with various permissions set up for different internal groups? Um, yes, again, that's a great question, um, and that's quite commonly used. So uh, you may want people to see your regulatory submissions, but, as an example, but not be able to change them. And so you can set up internal groups um, to be able to view documents and get access to documents, but uh, they only get access to the folders you give them permission to get access to. And you can decide what the controls are on those documents so that, for example, if you don't want them to print them or copy them or save them, you give them the same kind of controls you might give an outside party. Um, but maybe you want to give them access to the documents but not the original. Um, I didn't mention this, but within Sherlock, you can upload documents in any of 300 different formats, including the Office documents and PDFs and GIF images and AutoCAD documents and others. When you do that, Chevrolet creates a PDF copy of every non-PDF document, and that becomes a protected document. So to answer this question, one of the things you can do is, if you don't want to share spreadsheets with your internal um, staff, but you want to give them access to the information, you can give them a PDF copy of it, and that can be done automatically through Chevrolet. The nice thing, again, is that you have an audit trail of the activity um, so that you know when your internal staff. I, I know one example, um, give you another example of how it gets used. Um, some companies actually use ShareVault to share sensitive documents with their sales team. Um, and the sales team may see the customer lists and the price lists, but maybe they don't get copies of those price lists. Um, or, again, you can use the mechanism in ShareVault to retract access to those documents if those salespeople leave. So there's a variety of mechanisms, and I hope I answered this question, where you can share the documents within your organization with various permissions. You've got the audit trail, and you decide, do they get access to the original document? Do they get access to just the PDF copies? And they can have varying levels of protection on them. And then you have the audit trail of activity as well. So hope I answered that uh, question for you as well. Um, other questions? about these systems. What you, um, in looking at these systems, another thing just to think about is do they work on Macs as well as PCs? There are some that just work on uh, PCs. Um, what you want is a system that works on Macs, certainly in the life science arena, and that's partly why ShareVault's been adopted by so many of these organizations. Um, the, the system works equally well on um, PCs as well as Macs, and um, supports all browsers. So really all you need is a um, browser to be able to access the system. Um, it's very commonly used by uh, large pharma. Uh, large pharma is used to these kinds of systems. Uh, I illustrated a couple of them. Um, both they used to act as customers, but also as users. Um, we have a lot of those biopharma and med device and other companies that are being shared, that are sharing their documents with um, a Stryker or a GSK or a Novartis or Roche. Um, and so all of those organizations are very familiar with ShareWalt. And sometimes we get the question, um, are they uncomfortable being monitored? Um, I can't answer if they're uncomfortable about it, but they know that they are being monitored. They understand that. And that's part of the um, process that, uh, that they're going through, that they're being monitored. Um, some of these organizations have the system themselves, so they recognize you know, they're on the other side of it as well, a lot of monitoring too, so um, they're, not un they're not generally, I don't believe, uncomfortable with it. Um, some organizations actually, and I don't know if any of you who are still um, on here um, are aware of this, but uh, there's some large pharma that actually require you to use a virtual data room or a system like ShareVault because um, of their own exposure. If you send them documents, whether it's through any of the mechanisms I illustrated earlier, but if you send them documents directly and they distribute them to their internal um, staff to review, the tox people, the clinical trial people, the quality people, the manufacturing people, um, they've lost control over their documents. They don't have an audit trail. They don't have the systems in place internally to be able to track that very carefully. And so there's a very, very large exposure that they have. And certainly if there's no deal that goes through, their ability to make sure that somebody doesn't still have that information on their computer 
um, is, a, is a lot of effort and, and overhead to do that. And so many of these organizations actually require somebody, require a system um, like um, ShareWall to be able to uh, protect themselves. Uh, one question about getting pricing info, um, email me or contact me, you know, uh, give me a call. Um, and happy to share pricing information. What we mostly um, go by again is the term of the, it's helpful to know the application, um, partly so we know whether the documents are going to change in volume. Um, so it's helpful to know the application. Um, it would be useful to know the um, time involved in, uh, um, that you need the system for. Many organizations now just using it on an ongoing basis, not just for deal, but because they're sharing documents with their board members, with their CROs, CMOs. It's just a continuous um, use, and so they will subscribe annually. But we'll work with you on whatever term you're interested in having the system available for. And, um, and then let us know what you think the volume of documents is going to be, or what the range of the document volume is going to be, and, uh, and we can give you pricing information um, that way. Another way to get it actually is we do offer a free trial. You can come to the ShareWalt.com website and give you more of a demo. I didn't I just um, today was not really meant to be a demo of ShareWalt, more a demo of how you control and monitor the documents. But um, we can give you more of a demo. But you can also sign up for a free trial. And many organizations just want to get a feel for it, find out if it will work for them. And they'll upload their documents during the free trial, and that way you know what the volume of documents is going to be. Maybe you build a little headroom into it so you get to see what the, so you've got some sense of how the documents might grow. And, and then we can give you pricing information based on that. OK, some great questions. I really appreciate the questions. Um, if you have any others, um, Certainly can uh, stay here for another couple of minutes. We're still within the time frame um, blocked off for this event. And, uh, and otherwise, feel free to send them to me. Again, I'm happy to share the slides uh, with you if that's of interest.